This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Welcome to another episode after the holidays, I should say after the Thanksgiving holiday, which is kind of unique to the United States, although I know that Canada celebrates its own Thanksgiving Day then as well. Be that as it may, I hope that everyone here in the U.S. had a delightful time with friends and family and uh, plenty of turkey or whatever it was that you your heart's desire. It was certainly a time for us to give thanks, and I did. Uh, it, it gave thanks then for all of you guys and gals who listen every week. I thank you very much for coming back and listening to these episodes. It is always a lot of fun. We have the holidays of uh, Christmas and Hanukkah before us that is coming, and I'm excited about that. And uh, because uh, that of when the Christmas holiday falls, which is on December the 25th, is going to be on a Monday. That means that most magicians will have four full weekends of performing because typically we just get about three weekends. That is the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday or Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, many magicians are going to be working throughout the all the holidays. It doesn't matter whether it's a weekend or weekdays, but for those who are working on weekends, again, we get an extra weekend out of it because it's a little bit longer. They have more weekends, I guess, here this month before the actual Christmas holiday. I personally am going to be acting as a Santa Claus for quite a few uh, occasions, working with Neiman Marcus and a few country clubs and Christmas tree lightings at uh, shopping malls and outdoor and indoors and private parties and things. So I have my month cut out for me then as well. I'm going to be posting some pictures in my new Santa Claus outfit that you'll see on Facebook if you follow me. And so if you'll go to Facebook and start uh, following the magic word, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Well, I don't want to get into a lot of detail. We're not here to talk about that because that's next week when we're going to be starting to get into our uh, Christmas mode and start thinking about what it is that we want to buy for our loved ones or, or to have our to recommend to our loved ones to buy for us some things that are great. In fact, if you have a particular wish or desire or something that you're looking for that you would like to have for Christmas, this would be a great opportunity to use the speak pipe function that is on the website. If you go to the magicwordpodcast.com, you'll see speak pipe is one of the little apps over to the side. And if you click on that, you can leave a message. I'd be glad to relay that to the rest of the listeners and to post that on an upcoming podcast. Basically, I'd like for you just to tell me what it is that you want for Christmas. And if you also have perhaps uh, something that is a new trick that you've come out with that you think would be pretty cool for other magicians to know about, let me know about that too. I don't mind posting that then as well. I think it's a good way of trying to share the holidays with uh, with everyone else here that way. So again, go to themagicwordpodcast.com, click on Speak Pipe, and leave just a short message, and there's nothing to it. That's, that's all quite easy. A lot of stuff, uh, again, uh, happening here this holiday season, I know, and you're going to be traveling. And so I want to get into uh, this week's episode because it's one that I've been holding on to for a little while. This uh, past summer when I was in New Orleans for the Society of American Magicians annual convention, I had an opportunity to sit down with the uh, person who was the former acting director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. That's John McLaughlin. I have known John for quite some time and I always enjoy getting a chance to chat with him. And this time I had a chance to actually sit down and talk about uh, a variety of things that I think you're going to be hanging Hanging on every word. I mean, goodness, he is such an excellent speaker, and the stories he has to share are just amazing. When you stop and think about how that spy craft is similar to the craft of magic from the standpoint that they both are involved with secret keeping, I just think it's kind of interesting. And so we do talk about that, among other operations that have been declassified that are interesting. There are a few things that we do talk about. One is called Project Mincemeat, which is available on a streaming video. I believe it's on Netflix that you can check that out. It is uh, worth your time to go and see that movie 
movie. It's not a documentary, but it's a it, it's a good movie, uh, and we talk about that here this week, as well as the War Magician. And if you're interested in more information on the War Magician, if you go again to the MagicWordPodcast dot com, there is a link there that you can click to go to Amazon, where you can buy either the Audible or the Kindle digital or the hardback paperback. There are different prices. Uh, and also each time you buy something from Amazon by using the link that we provide on the podcast website, then a little bit of that goes through their affiliate program to help the magic word. And we appreciate that any way that you can. Anyhow, John's got a lot to say, and I've already said way too much, so I'm just going to back out and let you hear from John here this week, because I know you're not just going to enjoy it, you're going to love it. So, please welcome my friend here this week, Mr. John McLaughlin, here on The Magic Word. We're speaking today with a gentleman who is from the East Coast, out in the Washington, D.C. area. Someone who uh, performs also with the magicians in the Washington area from time to time. We'll talk about that. But he also is uh, someone who some of you have seen or heard. I believe he has spoken before uh, at some conventions. And he also uh, speaks prominently uh, for some other corporate uh, events. He is a former director of the uh, CIA and when under the uh, George W. Bush administration. He is uh, currently a distinguished practitioner in residence for the Philip Moore Center of Strategic Studies at Johns Hopkins. That's the uh, School of Advanced International Studies out in Washington, D.C. And he has a very interesting life and some things I want to talk about including, if we get around to this, I'd like to know about the war magician. Was it uh, masculine, I believe? And so here he is. Anyhow, John McLaughlin. Hey, John, how are you? Hey, Scott. Good to be with you. <laughs> Love and your podcast. Thank you very much. I'm so glad that you joined me here today. I wanted to find out a little bit, uh, as I said, I mentioned about the war magician, and you've studied that, I guess, a little bit, haven't you? And the uh, Well, I've looked into, yes, I've looked into the relationship between magic, intelligence, and war, and so forth. And in that case, uh, Jasper Maskelyne was the person you're referring to. uh, Yes. Scion of the British uh, magic family. Yes. Uh, There's a book called The War Magician by David Fisher, and I think it's David Fisher. And I think it probably embellishes the story a great deal. Uh, But all that said... Uh, in other words, I don't think he did some of the things that is a, that are alleged, such as being able to create a false picture of Alexandria or Cairo from the air. Uh, yeah, with so the forth. lights and everything, and all of that. Yeah, the Germans. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's uh, that's the embellishment. Uh-huh. But uh, the scholars who've looked into it uh, acknowledge that he did do a number of things that were important. For example, he developed a a camouflage unit for uh, for British tanks um, uh, called a sunscreen. And the way it worked was that it was in two units that folded up over a tank and made it look from the air like a, a truck, like an innocent truck, mm-hmm. and therefore you know, not like a tank target to German aircraft. And also he developed a device that went along behind that uh, tank uh, and scraped the tank trucks off of desert sand and desert roads uh, hmm. so that you couldn't see the tread of the of the tank. So in, in that sense, he made a contribution. And he, he did some other things, mostly involving camouflage. And when he came back from the zone, uh, still during the war, he taught British and American officers uh, techniques uh, drawn from magic and uh, uh, involving mainly escape techniques and such, should they be captured. Oh. And... Uh, and so forth. And also, during his time in Cairo in particular, there's a very nice photograph of him uh, doing magic for an assembly of, I assume, British and uh, local officers. Uh, mm-hmm. He's got linking rings hanging on his arm, so most magicians can immediately identify <laughs> exactly. with him in that in that mode. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'd heard much about this book, and I haven't read this, uh, but also I've heard there have been many attempts in trying to make this into a movie with Tom Cruise and several others. I think Benedict Cumberbatch was one who was yeah. recently uh, touted as being someone who was in the running for doing that. So I've not heard anything 
further about that. There's probably a movie in it, and, uh, and yeah. I suspect Hollywood would further embellish, embellish the tale. It. I don't mean to diminish his role. My sure. point is he had a significant role mm-hmm. uh, and and also designed some, uh, designed some concealment devices that were used for uh, you know a variety of things by uh, British espionage. And yeah, so spyware forth. kind spyware of Spyware type mm-hmm. things. Yeah. I, I don't mean to diminish his role. I'm just saying that uh, it's the kind of story that... Uh, uh, begs for embellishment, and, uh, and one author at least uh, yielded to the temptation. Uh, when he was developing that, weren't the records sealed, as I recall, for some number of years for, uh, before they were released? Well, British uh, intelligence and war records uh, have are usually sealed for a long time. Mm-hmm. For example, the best example I can give you is the example of uh, um, Project Ultra, which most people now know about. It's the project the British had initially uh, to break the code of the German Enigma machine, Mm -hmm. which was the code, it was a machine that uh, basically put their military orders into a very elaborate code Mm -hmm. using multiple alphabets. It was was an elaboration on earlier code techniques, but uh, much more complex. And changing every day. Changing every time they used it. Every time they used it. Every time they used it. And um, it was uh, broken, the code, by uh, a British uh, scholars, particularly um, – um, I'm blanking on the name. It'll come to – David Tur- – uh, rather, uh, uh, Turing, Alan Turing. Turing Alan, Alan Turing. Turing. Yes. And um, that was done at Bletchley Park in outside of London, which you can go and tour these days and see some of the equipment from that era. A friend of mine was the chairman of the restoration project there, a former head of British intelligence. Mm-hmm. And uh, my point, though, to return to the question you asked, is that that project was not known to the public until 1974 when someone finally wrote a book about it called Project Ultra, mm-hmm. or Top Secret Ultra, it was called. What does that mean? Well, it means that every history of World War II written before 1974 was written without knowledge of the fact that The British, in many cases, were reading the military traffic before Hitler was and often knew well in advance, uh, particularly uh, about submarine operations and other military operations, Mm -hmm. what was going to happen. Uh, And so they kept that secret all that time. There's a wonderful story (laughs) that a British uh, former defense minister told me, and I went back to him again and asked him, are are you – that's so – that's such an incredible story. Can I believe it? Is it true? The story goes like this, that a woman who worked in that project mm-hmm. uh, kept it secret for many years, including from her husband. Right. And later in life, she was going to a reunion of her former colleagues, uh, also secretly conducted, and she told him she was going to uh, you know, an insurance uh, function or something, somewhere where she worked at the time. And he said, well, thank you very much. Good night, dear. I'll see you later. And as she's at the event and walking down the hall, who does she encounter but her husband? <laughs> who had worked in the same project and never told and her. And they never knew. Yeah. It's, it's such a good story. I went back and asked, uh, it was it Malcolm Rifkin was the person who told me this, a former British defense minister. And I said, Malcolm, are you kidding? Did you make that up? <laughs> Sounds like a movie. He swore it was true. Wow. So I have to believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Which reminds me, I recently saw a movie, I believe it was on Netflix, and darn if I can remember the name of this, and you might know the name of the project, but it was, I think, some of the many people, the women and those who'd worked in Bleshley Park, and it was something in which they were trying to disguise um, where they were going to actually have the D-Day operations. They were trying to show they were landing in Greece, and so they had a body, they had dropped... It actually, have a Operation Mincemeat. Mincemeat, thank you. That's no, the one. No, Operation famous. Mincemeat. Highly recommend that movie. Is that pretty much true to form? Uh, it's a very accurate movie. They've, okay. they've injected a little more love interest than uh, yeah. that might have existed, but yeah. that's movies. Yeah. But it's a very accurate film, and uh, it was a genius project, and it a- actually worked. I mean, the, the complicated, but the, the mm-hmm. basic storyline was that someone, well, there's an interesting twist to it. The idea for the project, um, well, I, let me just get into the project. The project was basically to uh, find a corpse that they could use, dress it up as a British military officer, attach documents to it that suggested 
in code and sometimes a little easy to read code that the attack was going to come in Greece rather than in Sicily. This was at the time when the British and the Americans had succeeded in North Africa and they were planning an operation to jump from North Africa. It was called Operation Husky. Uh, Africa was Operation Torch. This was Operation Husky to jump across from North Africa to Sicily and from Sicily to go via Messina up the Italian boot. The Messina is very close to the body of uh, the, 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 the Italian peninsula. You could almost swim there. So uh, it was so obvious that Churchill looked at the map and said, it's, obvi it, it's, it's obvious to any observer, anyone who thinks that we're going to go to Sicily. So we need an operation to deceive the Nazis and to think we're going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And they came up with this idea of a body floating in the water Mm -hmm. uh, appearing to have been lost in a plane accident, washing up on the shores of Spain at a place called Huelva, as I remember, uh, just past Gibraltar, and uh, having documents on it which, uh, when they came to the hands of the Germans, the Spanish were then very close to the Germans. Nazis, right. And uh, passed them, and when they came into German possession, would be interpreted as mm -hmm. an attack uh, aimed at Greece or southern France or anywhere other than Sicily. And um, it's it's been written up in a number of books and now at least two movies. And um, and it worked. Uh, we now have documents uh, that show the initials of a number of Nazi officials, particularly the naval chief, on documents that indicate, yep, they, they interpreted it as it was intended to be interpreted. Wow. And uh, it probably saved a fair number of lives in... Sicily. I've been to those battlefields, and mm -hmm. they were hard-fought battles in Sicily. Because they were pretty much exposed, wide open when they got off the, the PT boats, and, I guess. Uh, they, well, and also they, they had uh, people coming in on gliders that were uh, oh. that had trouble when they hit hedgerows and mm. so forth. And there were, there were fierce battles there, but the Germans had moved a number of their forces to the northern part of the island and had thinned out the force, so it wasn't as bad as it could have been. And, of course, there was a famous race between... Montgomery and Patton to see who could who, yes. who could catch the Germans first. And uh, regrettably, that in the context of those times, the Germans escaped across the strait to uh, Italy and mm -hmm. uh, the main force at least got away. But in any event, the Allies prepared. They, they, they succeeded in capturing Sicily and then having their bridgehead to the peninsula and up the peninsula where they had a fierce battle at Monte Cassino, one of the worst battles of World War II. Wow. Well, that's why spyware and espionage figure so heavily and why it's so important. And what could happen, I guess, if one little thing goes wrong? And from what I understand the movie, and again, you can probably uh, confirm whether this was true or not, uh, they were talking about how that there was someone that was close to Hitler. Apparently, they, there was, around that time, towards the end of the war, some of his staff were thinking we need to get out and overthrow him and maybe uh, assassinate Hitler or something, and that in the movie, there was someone who uh, was close to Hitler who could give this the proper twist that would be in favor of the uh, of the British. Remember, was that approximately uh, right? I, or? I, I don't recall that, but here's the secret when you're doing a, cl a clandestine operation, a covert operation like that, and, and this is probably drawn from this idea, your target is usually, particularly in an authoritarian society as mm. Germany was then, your target is the intelligence service. In other words, you want to convince the intelligence service of what you're seeking to convey okay. as as a deception. Yeah. Because you know they're going to report it to the boss. Yes. And in an authoritarian society, they like to take good news to the boss. <laughs> you know, bad news can be trouble for you. Yeah. In that kind of world, probably the way Russia is today. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so... The fact that they had this great coup of knowing, oh, we have these documents we've recovered from a body, mm -hmm. and, and how they got the body is a whole other story sure. that's in the movie. That's, uh, it, was, it was done respectfully and, uh, mm -hmm. and with permission of parents. And, mm -hmm. Not and the way they, the movie portrayed it, I guess. No, no. It was done very carefully with permission of the parents who requested only anonymity and that the, their son be given a Christian burial, mm -hmm. which was done mm -hmm. in in Spain yeah uh, as major william martin not by his real name yeah and uh, lots of mysteries associated with this apparently up till 
1994, someone mysteriously placed flowers on that grave every year, and then after that, not. So one of yeah. those little mysteries that, to my knowledge, has not been solved. But, yeah. Uh, again, I found that interesting, and I'm sure there were several other stories like that that would make for good movies, but perhaps are maybe sealed. I assume that, that some things remain sealed for a long time. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that comes out of that that I tell students now when I, I teach is that um, I can talk about a lot of the things that are now public. Mm -hmm, of course. Um, you know, the Glomar Explorer operation where we, you know, went down uh, many, many meters under the ocean and picked up uh, clandestinely a, a, a sunken Soviet submarine. I think it was in 1968, mm -hmm. before I was at CIA. Uh, um, that's public, and uh, it's it was the equivalent of if you could stand on top of the Empire State Building and look down and see the little cars on the road and mm -hmm. imagine trying to drop a grappling hook and bring one of them up to the top of the Empire State Building. Wow. That's what we were doing underwater with a Soviet submarine. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I could talk about that, but the, the point is... Uh, a lot of these things remain secret for many, many years, which tells you that as you try and understand uh, events as they conclude in international affairs, there may be a, a hidden component that is not yet understood, as it was in the case of the Project Ultra. As I mentioned, you know, if you were writing about World War II in 1965, you mm -hmm. didn't know that uh, the, the British were reading uh, German military the German traffic, and, and the yeah. Americans, that was shared with the Americans too, but on a very restricted basis. I would think that that would have to be just a very limited number of people exactly right that they would share that with, because if I got out too big of a circle, then it's not good. <laughs> yeah, I've been told that uh, when Churchill wrote his memoirs before this was revealed, I've been told that there's one place in his memoirs where he 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 doesn't reveal it. Hmm. But he received those documents in a certain kind of box every day, a certain color box, and he mentions mentions that there were special material he was looking at. And Interesting. He doesn't say what it was. But. Well, I know Churchill was well known for his voluminous writing, as was uh, President Clinton. Uh, seems to do a, a lot of writing, you know, during his uh, tenure uh, as president then as well. And from, again, going back just to the movies, all that I know, it sounds like that Churchill was the one that kind of was in favor of going forward with that particular project, with uh, Project Mince Me, because there were other kinds of projects that everyone was coming up with and throwing things up against the wall to see if something was going to stick that that would work. And this seemed to be the most ridiculous. And I can't believe that, you know, Churchill said, let's give that a try. <laughs> I, I I don't know the truth of that, sure, but, it, but sure. knowing what I know about Churchill, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Now, when you uh, are teaching, are you teaching anybody like in just on history or specifically on spycraft? Or well, our school is a, a school that has been there since 1947, I think, mm -hmm. uh, or perhaps even a little earlier. But it was founded by people during World War II in, in America uh, who had a conviction that we needed a school that would prepare people for diplomacy and for service in government in the post-World War II era, where everyone understood the United States was going to have major responsibilities. Mm -hmm. There are other schools like this. There's one at Georgetown, and there's one associated with Tufts University, and one in, at GW, George Washington University. Ours is associated with Johns Hopkins University. And the students there, uh, about 800 at any given time, uh, scattered around three campuses in the world, one in Washington, one in Bologna, Italy, one in Nanjing, China. Um, go into maybe half of them into private industry and the other half into government and uh, some proportion of them into uh, private sector, private sector, start their own businesses and so forth. But mm -hmm. a large number of them go into government. And those are mostly the students who gravitate to my classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my, my course is uh, one that seeks to blend uh, an understanding of intelligence and foreign policy. How does intelligence inform foreign policy? How does it play in the process of making foreign policy? And, you know, and we've had recent examples of that, of course, very prominently in the case of the Ukraine war, where uh, unusually intelligence was revealed prior to uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, mm -hmm. essentially saying he, American intelligence has information that Putin is going to invade Ukraine. And that was done, I think, deliberately in, in order, as a kind of uh, influence technique. So, 
But uh, so I try and teach about how intelligence and foreign policy flow together to make national security policy and and defense policy as well. Was it a school like that where you w- went to learn? The, yeah, I, how did you, are you... Well, it turns out I graduated from this school myself okay. about you know fifty years ago. So there's a circle of life thing going on here. And I'm assuming you knew Herbert Walker Bush as well, George, because uh, yeah, he was the former CIA director before you. Is that right? Uh, uh, no, he he was CIA director in uh, 1974, I believe. Uh, okay. I knew him when he was president because at that time I was working on uh, a part of the world that uh, touched the Soviet Union and working on Eastern Europe. In fact, I briefed him two days before the Berlin Wall came down. In wow, first- that that was going to be happening? Uh, well, it, it, we were briefing him. He was going to a summit meeting with um, President, then President Gorbachev, Soviet mm-hmm. president, in Malta, of all places, and in 1989. And uh, I was briefing him on the situation in Eastern Europe, and I was explaining. In fact, my opening line was, Mr. President, I've torn my briefing up three times on the way <laughs> driving here because of the changes that are so uh, volcanic there now. Uh, You remember this period when people were in the streets in Prague and East Germany, East Berlin and Mm -hmm. uh, Budapest and so forth. The Soviet rule was coming apart and I was to brief him on what is going on there, what what do you need to know about this before you meet with Gorbachev. Right. And uh, he asked me, uh, will the Berlin Wall come down? And my answer was, for all practical purposes, it's gone. It it hadn't yet been physically breached, but we could see that the pressures at that point were such that it, it could It was not, imminent. It was imminent. Uh, and we had many clues before that, looking at Eastern Europe, that this was about to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, there was previously the Brezhnev Doctrine, which meant that uh, if you defied Soviet rule in Eastern Europe, we probably going to come in and invade you. Okay. And uh, Gorbachev basically ended that by allowing a certain amount of reform to take place in Eastern Europe without stopping it. And once uh, he took his hand off, um, then I think uh, word went round that you can, you can change. And we could see that coming probably as early as 1986 or 87. We could say, no, Eastern Europe, the pillars of stability are eroding there. And this is a predecessor to, you know, trouble in the Soviet Union. And is it, was it natural or predicted about the oligarchy and everybody coming in as far as the mob taking over and, you know, changing all that? I mean, people who were just, I mean, it's still not a democracy, but they have, of course, not a democracy, but I mean, is they uh, uh, are trying to steal people's possessions and... Well, if you're talking about uh, Russia... Yes. Um, I, I don't... I don't think people foresaw precisely that. Uh, th- there was uh, a great pressure to um, encourage Russia to privatize uh, an economy that was totally state-controlled, mm-hmm. uh, uh, called the command economy, and and uh, and and uh, everyone I think wanted them to do that. Um, looking back, you know, hindsight, I, I would say that. Uh, everyone, including the United States, probably encouraged them to do that too rapidly Mm. because as they did, a lot of uh, former communist leaders uh, exploited the rapidity and the confusion to seize uh, ownership of state uh, factories and assets and so Mm -hmm. forth and then convert them to private business and make a lot of money. uh, And that's sort of become the Russian system. It's a complicated system, but that's Seems one element. Seems very complicated. Yeah, it's one element of it. Yeah. Wow, wow. I would imagine also being a magician and secrets that uh, you keep. Do you feel that you are a good secret keeper? I, obviously you are when it comes to your job, but when it comes to magic, you know, a lot of times when we're sitting around, it's like, well, let me show you my way of doing that. Well, let me show you how that's done. Or do you kind of keep things to yourself? Oh, no, in the magic world. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're here at a convention now and, yeah. uh, you know, it's all about sharing uh, up right. to a point. I mean, I just came from a, a lecture where... Uh, Someone shared a lot, but not everything. In other words, uh, <laughs> held back a little. Held back a little because uh, it's a technique they had developed that uh, they haven't yet um, exploited fully. But you know, in, in the magic world, you, you, you know, that's what we have conventions for: is learning, sharing. Uh, what I love to do at a convention is just absorb. 
Right. And uh, learn and, uh, you know, ask people, how would you do this? How would you do that? Uh, mm -hmm. Refine what I'm doing and so forth. Right. Did it seem to be that you, this, uh, that magic was an outgrowth of your interest uh, in the CIA or vice versa? Well, I don't, the two are uh, related they are. as disciplines, but they didn't, re they didn't affect, they didn't, one did not cause the other as best I understand. Mm, okay. And by the way, you gave me a bit of a promotion at the beginning when you called me the director of the CIA. Okay. I was at the end of my career for about uh, uh, four months, the acting director. Acting and director. prior to that, for four years, I was the deputy director. I was nominated by President Clinton and confirmed by the Senate then. And then I stayed through the first four years of uh, George Bush's presidency, the first term of George Bush. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that time, the then director resigned, George Tenet, and I became the acting director for a number of months. Until they appointed someone else? Until as, they appointed someone and else. And who was that that took your place as a um, full time director? Uh, P Porter Goss, a, a former okay. congressman. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the period I was there was a tumultuous period, and being acting director or deputy director or director, there wasn't much difference because there was just so much coming at us that... Uh, George Tennant and I particularly just were. How was that? What, what all was going on? Well, um, you know. What if, was the confluence of events? I mean, it sounds like. Well, at the end of the Clinton administration, we had the major terrorist attacks. Uh, Al Qaeda was uh, beginning to be a factor in the world. They There were attacks on our embassies in uh, Africa in 1998, an attack on a, uh, an American warship in the year 2000. Many lives were lost. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and we had uh, tensions between uh, India and Pakistan involving nuclear weapons. We had the Balkan wars underway mm -hmm. at, the, at the beginning of my tenure as a deputy director. China and Taiwan, were they? Uh, that's always in the background, but they weren't particularly flaring like at that today. moment. Yeah. It was quiescent. Uh, and then uh, after I was, uh, I'd been deputy director for about nine months, we had uh, the 9-11 attacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the CIA had enormous responsibilities after that. We had been chasing al-Qaeda and I think having a lot of success in, in stopping attacks prior to 9-11, but we didn't stop 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, you anticipated something big was going to happen? We anticipated though? something big would happen. Uh, that's documented in the 9-11 Commission report. Right. Um, uh, and we warned that something big was going to happen, but we could not pin down right. exactly what it was going to be. But all that summer before 9-11, uh, as the 9-11 Commission documents, uh, uh, our motto was, the lights are blinking red. We oh just my. can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then once it happened, uh, we felt uh, responsible for stopping. Well, we were we were responsible more than any other part of the government for stopping it or making sure it didn't happen again because we had worked so hard on al-Qaeda as a, as a threat. And so the president basically said, I want you to be the first ones into Afghanistan. And we, 15 days after 9-11, we had two teams on the ground in Afghanistan preparing the way for special forces to come in. That would have been in um, October and uh, Kabul had fallen then by November. So with all of the trouble that we've experienced in Afghanistan and the sort of tragic end of that war, uh, at CIA we often say that we won twice in Afghanistan, once once in defeating the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in 2001, and then again in the middle of that decade, roughly 2006, when there were fair elections in Afghanistan and Mm -hmm. brought a brought a an elected president to power and then things kind of went downhill after that that's but that's a complicated story yeah, whole, oh <laughs> a whole other have to take that semester in school maybe yeah, to yeah. study that to go into more detail yeah. on that but i was always kind of, kind of curious in thinking that uh, the cia and the fbi is certainly is a there are organizations having to do with keeping secrets and being secretive and i just had wondered about how many people that might have a job doing that but also be have an interest in magic or well, magicians. you know, I I, uh, I I I got interested in magic uh, as my badge here says in 1953 when I saw the famous Houdini movie with Tony Curtis oh, yeah. and as a little kid and I said, whoa, that's what I want to be, and I ran to the library and got every book I could get on Houdini and mm -hmm. as soon as I read about those, you know, Harold Kellogg's biography of 1927, I guess it was. Uh, and then I said, well, can I get some magic books now? And uh, my first magic book was Fun with Magic by Joseph Leeming. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I sat in my little attic room with cardboard and glue and made all sorts of tubes and cards and mm -hmm. things, as most people, most of us have done at, as sure. little kids. And uh, for some reason, as we say, the worm got in my head and I never lost interest and uh, pursued it. Uh, so it didn't lead to an intelligence career. That came from being drafted and sent to Vietnam and and assigned to an intelligence job, which was the first time that I ever encountered. Did you apply for that, or did they just assign it to you? Had a choice of things, and you thought, well, this would be interesting. Well, I, when you're drafted, you have the option, uh, going back to that era, of either just going or saying, well, okay, now, uh, what are my options? Do I yeah. have any? And I took a course, at, uh, took a test for officer candidate school. What was your draft number, by the way? Do you remember? I have no idea. Oh, mine was well, 151. That's why I won. Uh, I, I think I was before the numbers. Okay, I think wow. Okay. I was before the uh, lottery. Uh, okay, yeah. I, I, was, uh, I was drafted in 1966, uh, and I I think two. the lottery started around 68 or 9. Yeah. I, well, uh, 68, 69 was the year I was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was commissioned as an infantry officer. And then they took a look at me and said, you know, you, you've studied languages and done some other things and you've got a graduate degree. So we're going to put you in intelligence. Mm -hmm. So that was my first uh, exposure to that in Vietnam. And uh, along the way, someone, uh, we were running for a bunker one day in a mortar attack and some uh, some old sergeant who was kind of my uh, mentor there said, kid, you know, if if you like this sort of thing, they have jobs like this at CIA. He was making a joke because we were diving into a bunker <laughs> yeah. and trying to lighten the yeah. mood a little bit. A little bit. And, uh, I, you know, it just stuck in my head somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so next time I went, I went back to graduate school and uh, at some point kind of got bored with it and said, I think I'll go apply to the CIA. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was it. Hmm. And magic was, though, I, I've given talks on magic and espionage as kindred arts because I, I used to tell uh, intelligence officers, I, I, I can't, I don't want to, I'm not going to teach you magic tricks to use in the intelligence world, but if you think like a magician, it yeah. will help you. Right. It, because magicians think in a certain way. Yeah. We have principles like uh, being one ahead, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Take the cups and balls. By, the, by the time you have the the loads in there, you're so far ahead of the audience, right. and and the the great delight you have is in the reveal. But you're ahead, right? Uh, or uh, the whole concept of outs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're in a tight situation, uh, or for example, you're seeking to recruit a foreign agent. Okay. Think about that. You're saying, "Will you commit treason on behalf of my country?" Right. <laughs> and uh, you know. What if they say no? What's your out? Right. Or what if they... Because you'd be putting, you're being put in a pretty awkward position if they do say no. It's like uh, suddenly you're exposed. Well, you're exposed. It can be dangerous, although you probably don't want to get to that point unless you're pretty confident that the going answer turn. is going to be yes. Yeah. But you don't know what's going to happen. Human mm -hmm. beings are unpredictable at the end. And so you need an out. Mm -hmm. Or you're in a negotiation with someone. What's your out? What what if it doesn't work? You know, it's magicians think this way, mm -hmm. and it's surprising how many people and how many <laughs> normal people <laughs> don't, don't think that way. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, and uh, so do you try to teach? You're, the students who are interested in going to the CIA to think like a magician? I mean, is there like a, not a whole class about that, but that's... Well, I, 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 I talk about it, and uh, I work uh, a trick into every... Is that the newspaper terror? I know you're famous for that. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's one thing I've done, uh, but I try and work an effect into every lecture. Mm -hmm. If you call it a lecture, it's more than a lecture because it's more of a lecture plus discussion plus, you know, seminar type. But it's two and a half hours with students um, in, in a session. And so um, if I'm um, talking about uh, the importance of perception and, uh, and jumping to conclusions, mm -hmm. uh, be careful about jumping to conclusions, be careful about first, first impressions. Uh, uh, they can lead you to conclusions that can be wrong. The spot card is a very good help. Oh. on that because you know you've got one spot two spots what's four next? spots yeah. six, mm -hmm. what's next oh here's how it works but it doesn't really work that way you've jumped to the conclusion that there are that many spots there. Mm -hmm. or um 
something like um um well the newspaper for example um I'm going to show you a newspaper. I'm going to tear it up. I'm going to put it back together. You ready? Mm -hmm. I do it. How many of you were mildly mystified by that? All the hands go up. Mm -hmm. Well, think about that for a minute. Think about that. I told you in advance what I was going to do. Explained exactly what I still fooled you. Now, think of how much easier it is for someone to fool you if they don't tell you in advance. Mm -hmm. So in the intelligence world, you have to be aware all the time that the other side is trying to deceive you just as you may be trying to deceive them. So there's a whole discipline of um, counterintelligence and, and uh, deception that is you know, part, of the, part of the business. Boy, the trust issues just have to be tremendous. I mean, who do you trust and how do you know? Oh, yeah, goodness. The whole profession is built on trust. Yeah. You know, when you hear of some of these leaks that occur or people who've committed espionage or spied for another country, Americans, you realize you can test people, you can uh, do polygraphs, you can do background investigations, mm -hmm. you can get recommendations. You have to do all of that, but at the end of the day, it's all built on trust. Mm -hmm. It's all built. So you have people have to trust each other, and you know, trust trust is the currency of human interchange really true uh but i was just thinking that would be something that you'd have to build uh in spycraft again of learning to get people to trust you and to believe what was well, what we, that's what we do as magicians we want people to believe we have a conviction that what i'm showing you is correct or you know my hand is empty when you've just shown it you know with something in it for an example or whatever that you have to have the conviction and believe that so they trust you so i would think that's one of the techniques that that agents would use of trying to uh, prove to their counterpart, I guess, that, hey, you can trust me, but really, and vice versa on the other side. Too, well, the tr trust is run through the whole business. It's a common thread. Uh, leaving aside trying to recruit foreign agents just yeah. among people who work in the business, um, the if, if there's a single internal business ethic, it's honesty with each other and trust um, in, in within the workforce. In other okay. words, if you've got a bunch of people who have been trained to go recruit foreign agents, they they have to engage in that enterprise. Mm -hmm. But within the organization itself, you have to be totally honest with each other because any lack of honesty will lead to a a bad outcome in some operation. But mm -hmm. in terms of the whole um, business of what we call human intelligence, that is, and by the way, it's much more the business is much more complicated than that. There's a huge component of it that is analysis. There's the part that's in the movies. That's the human yeah. intelligence clandestine operations. It's, there's a whole part that's science and technology. And uh, increasingly, there's a part that's also uh, uh, information science and, and information uh, architectures and techniques and right. artificial intelligence and all of that. But in the human intelligence business, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a kind of a pattern that we talk about for how you acquire a human agent. You spot, you assess, you develop, you recruit. Well, spot means who am I looking for? Assess means who are they? Uh, develop means build a relationship with them. And at that point is when you have to establish trust that, that uh, this person understands that you are who you are, who you claim to be, and that you will protect them. And if they do this, you will guarantee their security and so forth. Right. Right. Well, again, that goes back. I it's was difficult say, stuff. Very difficult. I, I always tell students, this, we're talking here about one of the most complex human relationships you can imagine because it involves all sorts of things. It's like a marriage. It's, it, it involves back and forth. It mm -hmm. involves a degree of trust. It involves some manipulation. It involves sometimes affection. I don't mean affection in a... Yeah, in a I mean in, in the sense that you like the person, but you're also you're using them. It's a complicated... Business and I tell people you you only do this because it's that way if it's something that the United States really needs for its security and can't get in some other way. Mm -hmm. It's not something you do casually, right? There's a lot of too many risks involved for everyone, uh, right? Um, I was thinking about con men uh, who are really good at what they do, yeah, and uh, they could if if someone is trying to. Uh, recruit them and they can say, yeah, I'm kind of with you. But on the other hand, they're like a double agent, I guess, you know, 
they're uh, kind of going along with you, but they're realizing, hey, I think he's going to try to recruit me or something, but you're conning the guy. Your biggest job is to figure out that. If, okay. If, 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 because wow, sometimes difficult. sometimes uh, the other side can um, dangle someone in front of you as a uh, someone that they think you would like to recruit, mainly to find out if you are the recruiter. Just part of the assessment, I guess. Part of the assessment is, uh -huh. is this person real? Mm -hmm. And you, you go to pretty elaborate lengths to determine that. And uh, and then, you know, when you're gathering their information, you don't initially just take it as gospel. I mean, it takes a long time for a person to develop a reporting record that allows you to say, this is a reliable source. Yeah. And I'm sure they're coming back then and talking with their supervisor or whomever and trying to work this out. Do they kind of have conferences, or I say conferences, I mean uh, meetings where they're talking not just with a supervisor, but with other people, or yeah, yeah, it's or, uh, are you kind of out in the cold and doing it on your own? No, no. Um, there, there are times when you are on your own because you can't plan and predict everything. Like a, we come back to the concept of outs. Yeah, I mean, you know, as a magician, you are out on the stage on your own. Mm -hmm. You're doing something risky, right? In many cases, you know they might not take the card. the 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 thread may break. the uh, the, the battery may not work in your whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so sometimes you are out there on your own. Once uh, you pass the go sign, but in planning these things uh, and in preparing to do them, uh, it's a collaborative process. In other words, you're not by yourself. You, mm -hmm. you you test your ideas. You get a lot of help. You talk about it endlessly. You 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 game various uh, strategies and outcomes and so forth. I would forth. think so. It's, it's not unlike it's not unlike many other businesses in that respect. It's very very much like um, I gave a talk to a bunch of hedge fund managers and I said, you know, I'm from a business just like yours. <laughs> hmm. You guys are placing bets every day, aren't you? So. Yeah. So in the intelligence business, let's say, you know, you can't just go out and you can't tell me today, well, go out and get a bunch of agents in country X. Uh, we'd like to do something uh, next week. <laughs> no, it's, it may take weeks or months because it's a slow moving human endeavor. And sure. and yet because of that, you um, are placing your bets all the time about is this something we're going to need down the road? Certain With certain places in certain countries, yes, you're never going to need it. But at other times... Um, uh, who who is going to know much in advance that something's going to flare up? You don't. I mean, that's why I think you have to have these ears close to the ground to kind of hear what's going to be going on mm -hmm. all the time. And that's, again, the difficulty of that. So are people normally recruited directly out of school? I mean, or do people just apply for the CIA, I guess, every day? Or how does one get into the FBI and the CIA? That's it's well, these days, the best way is to go on the website. Okay. Uh, there is a website mm. and uh, download the application and fill it out. And uh, they ask you to write some essays and send in your resume and yeah. they look at all of them. And then you get a call if they're interested and uh, a conversation and then a decision about whether they want to bring you in to take a closer look. And things uh, have changed so much today, I think, with the advent. You mentioned artificial intelligence earlier, but uh, I mean... I I know, like white collar crime, for an example, the FBI. My gosh, you know, you have to be a, a computer forensic person to be able to go back and look at some of the details and understand coding and everything. That, to some degree, I mean, it's not like James Bond kind of stuff going out. That it's 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 changed. I'm sure just in the few years that you were there. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And since I've left, uh, it's changed dramatically. I think. Um... Uh, the sheer volume of information is probably the most um, discreet and obvious uh, change so that when you're trying to detect threat and predict bad things happening, uh, the greatest danger is that you will miss the signal in a huge uh, volume of information. It mm -hmm. might be thousands and thousands and thousands of messages coming into your computer. and right. Within them, there may be, and I know a case. I know cases like this because I've been called back a couple times to look at um, things that we missed or failures that occurred. And and in one case, a rather important one, uh, I, I I could see that if you could line up, say, 
a certain dozen messages on the table and read them all in sequence, you would see this event coming and be able to predict it. But the mm -hmm. problem is those 12 were lost in or included in, shuffled into, like a deck of cards, <laughs> shuffled into literally thousands and thousands of things that were coming at people. Right. So you need information architecture, information systems that sort this stuff out, help you sort it out. You know, the best analogy I could give you would be like, um, you know, Amazon in a way. You know, you're interested in a, an electric razor and you get a message that says, you might also be interested in this. <laughs> right. So <laughs> there's a cable in from... Uh, uh, you know, Cairo that says X, well, you might also be interested in this mm -hmm. uh, because it's related to that. Right. Yeah. Reminds me a little bit, again, I mentioned Tom Cruise earlier about uh, maybe being the war magician, but also um, he was in a movie, The Minority Report. And I thought, that, I think it was a Steven Spielberg movie. It was pretty cool in which that it was you know, in the near future in which he's kind of walking down in a mall and they're saying, uh, Mr. So-and-so, uh, we have special on jeans today that, you know, it's your size or, you know, you're out of milk back at home in your refrigerator. So things that, you know, that um, we're getting to a point where technology knows us. So you said like with Amazon and so many other things that they are predicting what our needs are going to be. So it's kind of scary a little bit, you know, from like that then too. I was going to ask you about Washington, D.C., the uh, magic club that you have. And I know that you do some club, not meetings, but you have uh, shows that uh, you do with the group out there. And you started doing that, I believe, during the uh, lockdown, during COVID. Is that something that is now, I guess, a physical thing that you guys have a theater where you are performing? Yes. I'm glad you asked about it because it's very important to us. We... Um perform at a place called the Arts Club of Washington, which is on I Street in Washington. And mm -hmm. it's a wonderful venue. It's the former home of President James Monroe. It's 215 years old. It's an wow. old uh, townhouse. And uh, because we all, the four or five of us who perform there... Mm -hmm. You and uh, Eric Henning? Uh, Eric Henning, David Morey, mm -hmm. um, myself, uh, uh, Christian Matur, uh two or three other people. Uh, uh, Chris Bowers is one of them. Rahan Jackson mm -hmm. is a wonderful close-up magician. So typically, three or four of us are do a stage show, and Rahan and Krishan and, and, and others sometimes will do the close-up yeah. prior to the show. And we have guest performers. Uh, if there's a well-known magician coming through town or resident there who right. wants to join us, we work them into the, into the set. Um, uh, Larry Haas is now based in Washington, and he's performed with us uh, a couple of times. And it's a monthly thing? Well, uh, our or problem irregular. is uh, it's it's roughly monthly. Okay. Uh, and we've been dark for a couple of months because there is there was a fire uh, at the uh, arts club, and getting permits in Washington to restore a an historic property is very complicated. So mm -hmm. we're expecting to be back uh uh, working uh, working again in roughly October. It's about 60 seats um, in a small theater that's adjoining the um, townhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, we fill up all the time. And it's uh, a nice little stage. Uh, uh, it has, you know, lighting. We have an audio system. And uh, we're gradually making it more and more professional. It, it's, uh, it's a good date night, we always say, because <laughs> for drinks, dinner, and a show... Uh, you pay about uh, right now. I think sixty-five, seventy-five dollars, mm -hmm. which uh, is not, not, not a. That's, that's a, reasonable. Yeah. That's a cheap For, date in yeah, Washington. Dinner drinks, yeah, I think and, so. <laughs> and and it's a good. It's it's uh, and our styles are all a little different. Um, the show typically is about seventy to uh, eighty minutes, and uh, uh, we do some strolling. So there'll be there'll be like two or three stations in the. A townhouse that are fixed for a close up, but the rest of us will move around and do some strolling magic mm -hmm. as we encounter people as they're having drinks. So, it, if people come in, get their drink, circulate around, see the close up, uh, the bell goes off for dinner, or they pick up their food, it's usually buffet, they move into the theater if they wish, if it's right. set up. Sometimes we set it up with tables, sometimes we set it up with chairs. So, um, we're still still very fluid in terms of how we do all of this, but uh, it's uh, it's taking hold. And uh, I think uh, 
a great, great venue. It's a, it's a wonderful venue for magic. We, we always say it could be the magic castle of the East <laughs> if, with a little work because the house is beautiful. It's old. It's furnished beautifully. Right. It's got lots of art in it because it's an arts club. Mm-hmm. And they have music uh, performances there. Sometimes there'd be a pianist in the second floor uh, nice. playing while Rahan is doing <clears throat> uh, close up there. So is it mainly as a fundraiser to help the... Uh... No, for the, it, it's or for the club. Uh, or? It, it's it's uh, we we uh, are you paid the, individually for uh, people buy tickets and yeah. uh, and we pay the club okay. for uh, their service and the food and so forth. Uh, we're not making money doing this yet. Uh, right. I don't okay. know that we ever will or that we aspire to. We may, but that's all to be determined. It's a fun thing. Uh, David Morey, I, I, I hope I mentioned David. I believe you did. David is the uh, person who started this, and Eric mm-hmm. uh, Henning uh, came in to be the second major person. Savino Racine was also involved at the beginning and still is, but Savino's moved a little further away, so hasn't been with us too much in the last uh, couple of months. Mm-hmm. But uh, Savino used to be, own a major restaurant in Washington and for years was a prominent magician associated with the restaurant. Mm-hmm. Primo Piatti was the restaurant, Italian. He okay. is Italian. So we have a kind of a circulating cast. I'd say David is the one who uh, organizes the shows and works works through the, the first run of show. And we're getting to the point now where we have uh, you know, a formal run of show with music piped, music cues and everything all laid out on a sheet for the four of us or whoever's yeah. on stage. Each of you do what, about 15 minutes or so? Each of us does about uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. 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 We try and keep it tight. And when you have an outside person, well, you said Larry Haas is living in Washington now. Are are you paying them some stipend? No, no. So it's just a donation for it's, it's their just, town. It's it, like, it, hey, you want to come and do something? I think people do it because it's it's a nice venue. Yeah. The, the audience is very good. Uh, you know, people talk about a drinking audience and a thinking audience. It's it's mostly a thinking audience that has a couple drinks. Okay, <laughs> it's Fair it's enough. just the right balance, you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, and and it attracts uh, you know sort of the Washington professional set. Uh, but anyone can come, and we've had you know everyone from you know, butchers, bakers uh, to lawyers and PhDs and network correspondents, right. and you know just a kind of mixed group. I think people, it'd be people good, have fun. good networking also, I think, for magicians who are there of saying, hey, I like this guy. You know, I want to have him come and do my party then also. Yeah, people get work out of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, a couple of our performers are uh, at least part-time professionals. Uh, Eric is a full-time, Eric Henning is a full-time professional, uh, bills himself as the Wizard of Washington, and he's very successful and a very good magician. You should interview him sometime. Oh, I have. Yeah. Uh, as a yeah. matter of fact, he was probably within the first year. Yeah. Uh, Eric and I have been friends for a very long time. I've often touted his lecture notes, TIPS, tips, as one of the best set of lecture notes. It's got a lot of stuff in there and some ideas I still use uh, that are some tricks and some ideas that are just that, just tips. Oh, yeah. Uh, I learn something every time I talk to Eric. And yeah. of course, I, I do extensively when we're together in these shows. But he's an accountant, I guess, by trade, because he was talking about tax advice uh, in one of the early episodes that we had done. So if you go back into the archives at the com, you can type in Eric Henning, and I believe you could find that episode. It was early, him again talking about uh, for magicians, tax advice. Yeah, Eric has a background in finance. He's also had a background in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. He's a a well-known speaker. Uh, He's performed at many venues in Washington, including the the White House a number of times. Right. Um, David Morey is uh, the other. uh, David is the uh, principal organizer of this. David is a a well-known political strategist, political consultant, has his own company. Mm. Uh, Recently was in uh, the Philippines uh, working on a political campaign there and has worked on political campaigns around the world as a strategist and consultant. Mm-hmm. And uh, as he says, uh, magic is a hobby that's uh, way out of control. <laughs> uh, we, we, we all say that. We but, do. Well, we, particularly when we look at our, after the magic conventions, you see the stuff that you had purchased. It's like, <laughs> this has gotten out of control. I really didn't need to buy this, but it was so cool. I got to have it. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose everyone's had the experience that I've had of... Uh, 
coming to a convention and realizing that the stuff you bought at this same convention last year is still not opened at home. So it, it's a uh, it, it, that can discipline you a little bit. I've had that from magic auctions where I've got a bag, it's got my number on it, and I'll go to the auction the next year and I'll bring it home and I'll put it next to the bag. It still hasn't been <laughs> haven't that take, taken stuff out of the farmer. But, but that's the joy of it. You know, I, I always say I, I, I haven't used that. I bought it three years ago, but yeah. eventually I take it off the shelf and say now is the time. Mm -hmm. The time has come for that effect. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good thing because you kind of have an opportunity to let that percolate, you know, and you find the right opportunity that you've got something coming up. And uh, that's the problem. That's why we don't throw away things because eh, I'm going to use that eventually. Yeah. And, and my strategy is I do mostly the classics. And my strategy is to keep refining them, keep yeah. looking for ways to make them better, to add something. Uh, you know, I've uh, taken classes with Jeff McBride, who's a, mm -hmm. a fabulous teacher. Right. And, uh, you know, no one better at saying, here are the three little things you need to do to take that to another level, mm -hmm. which was I appreciate very much because, you know, perfection is in the details. Everything communicates. Mm -hmm. Every detail matters. Uh, scripting, what you're wearing, uh, how you talk, uh, everything. Attention to detail is the essence of showmanship, uh, according to Henning Nelms. Well, um uh, I'm for him. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing I live by. It is very, very important. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. I certainly appreciate this. And as you know, as I like to close, it's, it's my podcast. It's called The Magic Word. What is it, it's your philosophy of life? What do you live by? What's important? Oh, wow. Um, I think, for, for me, I was just thinking of, you know, I've been around a long time, and uh, I, I would say, the major thing for me is to respect other people, listen. The main thing I learned over many years of different professions is to be a good listener. Mm -hmm. Learn from everyone, take the good that you can find in everyone, and learn from it. Yeah, like that. John, thanks very much. Good advice. And uh, great talk. Man, I can't believe this just went so quickly. When I looked at my watch, it was like, wow. <laughs> This was so much fun and uh, informative. I want to go back and uh, listen to this. Well, I will several times. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure, Scott. I love the podcast and thank you so much for contributing this to the community. You're welcome. It's over the Magic Word Podcast. That was John McLaughlin. This is Scotty Out. Thank you very much, John, for being my guest this week. That was pretty darn awesome. I hope you, the listeners, enjoyed that as much as I did. It was great getting to sit down with this gentleman and learning so much. Uh, goodness sakes. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see John McLaughlin, tell him that you heard him on this podcast and how much you enjoyed that. If you have any other questions, I'm sure you can address them to him when you see him next time. You know, it used to be when I would see him at magic conventions, I would ask if he would be coming to the next whatever convention it was, IBM convention or whatever. And he was at the time saying, well, I can't always guarantee that because my movements are still being monitored by foreign agents, basically. So I thought, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> he has to travel in secrecy sometimes and not let people know where he's coming and going. Now he's a little bit more retired and has a little bit more flexibility to, to travel the way he does. Uh, he is still a very important man, but perhaps isn't monitored as closely as what he used to be by the, uh, the other side, whatever that might be. Well, anyhow, I admire him greatly and I thank, uh, thank him for the time and his words and uh, friendship. This is just just been uh, great. Well, next week we are going to start to get into the holidays. And as I mentioned at the first of the podcast, if you will, please go to the magicwordpodcast.com and click on the feature that says Speak Pipe. And let me know what it is that you want for Christmas or just leave your name. If you want, just leave a shout out saying Merry Christmas to your family or friends or whomever. Just uh, again, that'd be great. But just would like to post a few uh, Christmas greetings. And again, if you have a suggestion of something that you think that others might like that you have enjoyed or recently purchased, be sure to say that then too. Well, anyhow, as I said, it's going to be a pretty busy month for all of us getting into December. But while you're driving to and from some of these engagements, perhaps you might have a chance to download and listen to some of these episodes from the archives and including the new ones, because we're going to keep out there from week to week every Thursday 
posting these new episodes. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to respect other people. Be a good listener and take the good you see in everyone and learn from them. This is Scotty out.